Um, I'm so excited to be here. I think I'm in the presence of heroes. This is how I think of people who are working to make the world a bit better. It's not, not an easy pathway many of you have chosen. It really isn't. Um, and generosity in different forms flows around every part of your lives, given the, the pathway you're on. First of all, there's your own generosity, which, which is incredible. You are probably not making as much money as you could make doing other things because you've decided you want to make ripple effects happen out in the world. This is, this is I mean, to devote a life to something bigger than you are is, is I think, the ultimate act of generosity. And so I, I salute you, truly, for that. Um, but there's another way in which generosity impacts all of you in some ways. And that I, I think many or most of you <laughs> are dependent on the generosity of donors uh, and maybe volunteers and others. Um, and so you know, and I would bet that many of you spend a huge part of your working week stressed by the fact that that generosity isn't quite as much as you wish it was. I mean, am I right? The, the challenge of raising money for things that matter, so it's, it's just really hard. Um, and so this, this book um, was motivated in part for this challenge. So part of the book is just about acts of everyday kindness that anyone can do that in our connected age can go viral can spread online, and, and we can talk about that later on if, if people are want, want to. But I, I think for, for, for this group, I'd, I'd rather focus on this, this journey that many of us face of how we cut through the clutter in this world and let people know what we're doing and why it matters and secure the flow through of you know, the necessary funding and perhaps other resources to be successful. It's really hard. I think that's the first thing we need to acknowledge. It's really hard. Why is it hard? B because the world is so full of everyone doing everything. There's so much noise. There, there are so many demands on everyone's attention. Um, it's not that people are bad and don't give a damn about supporting people who are making a difference. It's just that they're busy. And that there's, there's a lot of other people talking to them. And so I, I guess one of the first things that I want to say is to explore the amazingness of the power of infectiousness. We're in an age, we're in a connected age, where infectiousness can happen like never before. So my, my start point in the book is imagining the world through the lens of the first coronavirus, just before it became COVID-19. There was that little thing sitting there thinking, you know, I'm, I'm kind of invisible, honestly. Like, I weigh less than a trillionth of a gram. How can I ever make an impact on the world? There's no hope. And then a few little atoms get tweaked, flow into a human body, boom! A few years later, you've managed to kill several million of us and shut down the world economy. So. My takeaway from this, <laughs> you, you do not have to be big to be powerful and influential. You don't. You just have to be, you figure out how to be infectious. And the thesis of the book is that generosity in all kinds of different ways can be retailored just a little bit in the age that we're in to become infectious. And, and when that happens, suddenly all bets are off. It's, it's really possible to imagine a very different future. Think about the mathematics of virality. Um, I mean, those, many of you will remember the R0 number from the, uh, from the pandemic. Basically, does, on average, one person infect more than one other person or less than one other person? So much hangs on that question. If R0 is 0.9, any form of infection, whether it's a virus or a story about your extraordinary organization, fizzles out. A few people get to hear about it, but word of mouth doesn't take it massive. If R0 is 1.1, a month after that story is out there, millions of people may have heard of it. So, so think about this, just in terms of how you plan your efforts in your working week. There is a real chance that 20% extra 
spark or imagination effort on an effort could kick the virality of something you're doing or a story about it from 0.9 to 1.1, and the difference in impact is not 20%. It is 10,000-fold. So this is amazing. This is, this is the era we're in where anyone in principle can be the butterfly that triggers the hurricane on the other side of the world. And it just becomes hugely consequential to figure out how. So there's a, there's a problem with the, the, the news landscape of the world, the stories that actually spread right now. Um, there are two things we're, we're battling against. And I'm speaking here partly as a, as a former journalist. I, I spent a while looking at, you know, trying to do a news story and learning why the news agencies put bulletin, big new, this is the big lead news story, on certain stories and not on others. And, and basically, with some wrinkles, the code was if 100 people died violently, that's your top world news story of the day. Could be a bomb, could be a plane, don't really care. Is there a lot of blood? It's the lead. And so, you know, this is, <laughs> I mean, a lot of us know about this, this cognitive feature of humans, um, probably important for our survival. We pay very, very, very close attention to threats. And so, if it bleeds, it leads. So much of our news is, is, is therefore of dramatic bad things happening. There's another issue why uh, we're biased towards bad news stories. And I think it's less talked about. And it, I, I think it's probably even more important. And it's this. We live in a chaotic, unstructured world. Good things happen slowly. Bad things happen quickly. So... You think about a building like this one. It probably took seven years from a gleam in some architect's eye, going through all the planning permissions and processes and construction and so forth and so forth, to get this thing built. There's no point in that process when someone said, hold the front page. And yet here we are, a building that attracts change makers, incredible things ripple out from this building. It is a force. It is an absolute force of what happens here. But the building itself, like any other building in London, could be taken out by a bomb in a second. Uh, sorry, I'm not, I don't have any inside information on this. I <laughs> prom promise you. Um, would that make the news? Oh, you bet. You bet. And so here's the problem, is that our media organizations... Basically, their mission is to ask this question, what is the most dramatic thing that happened in the last few hours? For both cognitive bias reasons and this structural reason, the answer to that question is almost always going to be something bad. It's just, it's just how things are. So none of those stories, like if you, if, I, if you read a story about a plane crashing and so forth, that is a true story. It's not like it's false. But the cumulative impact of all these stories gives us, I think, a false view of the world. We get depressed about the world, actually. Um, and many of you who work in, for example, public health just know just how false this is. So the same day that the plane crashed, let's call it yesterday, 20,000 children's lives were saved compared with 30 years ago by the F three decades of efforts of public health workers and others toiling under the radar to do amazing things and cut child mortality in half. It works out, when you actually look at the numbers, 20,000 kids are alive every day. And if you could take a camera into those homes and see them playing happily with their family, versus 30 years ago when, when the parents and the siblings were grieving because they'd lost yet another child to a preventable disease, you would be moved. It would be amazing. You would go, what an incredible time to be alive. Look at all this extra happiness that, that these efforts have wrought. You would feel differently about the world than you do reading the current news. So we're up against you know, something very difficult and hard. Um, but <laughs> what do we do to battle it? Like So many here, are, you are in this business of doing good Slowly. 
And it's fundamentally hard for those stories to break through. So what could help them break through? I mean, what I try and do in the book is, is identify a playbook from some of the people who have succeeded in getting stuff to go viral. And, you know, some of it we actually know, or certainly charities know. It's, it's, yeah, you evoke emotion. I mean, every charity pitch you ever saw probably involves some TV ad of something suffering, it's a child, a donkey, a, you know, whatever it is. And, and it's the, the, the image is designed to make people go, oh, I care about that. And that, that's actually powerful. I mean, you're tapping into, you know, em, emotion is the number one thing that drives um, virality. So it's, it's good to start there. Um, there's two other things I think uh, I saw again and again that make just a huge difference to breakthrough. One is insane levels of creativity. The more creative you can be about something, the better chance you have of having something break out. So there's this group um, in Japan, a group of friends, who wanted to clean up the streets. And so they organized a volunteer group to go up and clean it up, as one might, took out a camera to record it on video. Uh, but with dif this difference, they were samurais. They dressed up as samurai costumes and did this with incredible creativity and panache. The sword dashes down into the messy trash can, flips it up, someone else catches it in a basket, and they go on. And it was, it was, it's so cool to look at. Of course, the video of this goes viral and ends up inspiring thousands of other people to come out on the streets and clean up litter. Creativity. Are we, are we being ingenious enough? Are we taking the time to gather our most creative people and say, come on, let's think outside the box here. What would, what would really make a difference? I mean, the, the ice bucket challenge, for whatever we may think of it, someone, somewhere, had a bloody brilliant idea. You know, that, that it was creative, it was funny, evoked emotion, hilarity, and, and designed to go viral. And look at the impact that did. We can come back to some of the criticisms of things that aren't f maybe fully addressing system change or whatever. That, that's, that's an important part of the conversation. But for meanwhile, creativity is, is an incredibly important weapon in our arsenal. And the third one I'd, I'd point to is just courage. Um, being willing to take risks and to try stuff that hasn't been tried before or to go to a place of discomfort in some cases. People respond to courage. I tell the story in the book of, of Daryl Davis, who's an African-American musician who was puzzled why uh, people didn't like him because of the color of his skin. So he went out and sought a meeting with the local leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Hello. That was a stressful meeting, incredibly stressful. Um, they, they leapt to their feet at one point, thought someone had pulled a gun, you know, like it was... Somehow they agreed to meet again Daryl ended up going to KKK rallies, and um, they, they formed this weird friendship. The, his friend ended up leaving the KKK, and dozens of others followed. And, relevant to what we're talking about here, CNN saw this and ran a story, and other news organizations followed. This story became known to millions of people around the world, he gave a TED talk that was seen by um, millions more. Um, people saw that because of his courage, the, the reason CNN and others would, would have told this story is because it's like, wow, he did that? That's amazing. And when something is amazing, then you want to share it and spread it on. And as a result, millions of people around the world got a first-hand picture of what it takes to engage in what, what I think is actually a core act of generosity for the moment that we're in, which is bridging. You know, to, to be brave enough to stand up and, and say, maybe, I know, I know we all think others are only evil, but maybe we could be curious. Maybe we could learn their story. Maybe there's something we could actually learn from them. Maybe there's some way of building a relationship. Maybe we can shift the conversation by actually having a respectful conversation. I mean, if he could do that with the KKK, do you think we could bridge some of the political divide and so forth that is here? I mean, it's really, really hard to do, and no one wants to have their head blown off, especially by people on their own side. But Anyway, cur courage leads to virality when it's, done, when it's done the right way. So when you combine those things, um, 
there's, there's, there's a word for it, which I, which I love, which is audacity. Um, can we be more audacious? If we can, it's quite possibly the key to achieving more. So I learned this especially from a man called Richard Rockefeller. Some of you may, may know of him. He's from a famous philanthropic family. He wasn't particularly wealthy himself, but he, he was involved in a rich experience of the world of fundraising. He came on a trip, that, um, a boat trip, actually, that we went on with Sylvia Earle to tr and a group of nonprofits trying to raise money for various marine conservation causes. And the idea was um, you know, that, that there were donors on board this boat and that these individual nonprofits would try and attract donors and they would have little discussions and raise money. And um, on, the, on the second evening, Richard stood up and said, so I've observed that some of you are, are stressed by this process. It's hard. It's hard raising money. And everyone's natural instinct is to cut back and ask for less because you want to achieve something. It's better to achieve something than nothing. And so you say, okay, I'm talking to this donor. What might they ask for if they don't, can't afford the whole ticket for what I need? And so you cut back. He said, I strongly beg you not to do this. All of the best donors I know are not inspired by small plans. Don't ask for less. Ask for more. Be audacious. This is what he said. Be audacious. And... Um, and I, I never got those words out of my head. Um, it led, four years later, tragically, uh, Richard passed away a couple of years after that in a, in a plane accident um, that was on the front page of the news. Tri this, I mean, it's a ter uh, he was just a terrible loss to the world. He, so he never saw that his words inspired something um, that I was involved in helping build called the Audacious Project, which was an attempt to get past this, this same problem, but a problem that I s see at scale. So I'm married to Jacqueline Novogratz, who runs Acumen, um, which raises money to invest in entrepreneurs around the world to tackle poverty. I've seen what it's like to have a world-changing individual face the challenge of just, just raising, the, you know, tapping into the generosity that ought to be out there. Uh, how many meetings it takes, how much work it takes to have someone like her, who was so talented, to see her spending 30 to 40 percent of her time. And, and for many social entrepreneurs, it's actually 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of their time out in one bloody meeting after another, one at a time, one donor at a time. It just, it just felt so wrong. Like, how, how could the world be structured so that we have the people who are actually heroes and are, and are willing to devote their lives to doing amazing things, a.k.a many of you, um, how can we set it up so that actually what they do is not do amazing things but sit in fundraising meetings? This can't be right. Um, so there's that problem. And then there was another problem that I noticed. Because um, of my <laughs> role at TED, I got to meet some people who actually were resourced enough to be quite big donors and actually had the mindset where they wanted to give back. But when you talk to them about philanthropy, they were like, yeah, but... I don't know, I just haven't, hasn't sparked yet. Like they, would, they would have pitches made to them, and they didn't actually use this word, but this is my interpretation of what they were saying. Philanthropy as pitched to them was often boring. <laughs> and they got wealthy, as Richard Rockefeller said, by, by dreaming big dreams, doing big plans. So the Audacious Project was an attempt to solve both of these problems. And this is how it works. We go to people who are trying to make change, open application process, and say, OK, what is the biggest thing that you and your team could achieve, the absolute biggest thing you could achieve, if money was no object? Make the case. Come up with a plan that will make the hair stand up on the back of our heads. You know, give us goose, goosebumps. Turns out that people have dreams, big dreams, exciting dreams. When you ask that question, so we get more than a thousand applications a year now for this thing. We, <laughs> some of them are crazy um, and probably unworkable. We try to find, we filter down to those that 
are both amazing but credible. There's evidence to suggest that they can be doing it. The team has some kind of track record of doing something good and, um, and help shape these into credible multi-year plans with a budget. Um, and then we bring donors together. So the key here is to break out of the sort of one meeting, one after the other. This is not, by the way, how, how um, for-profit entrepreneurs raise money. They raise money from venture capitalists who have pooled already money from multiple investors, and they raise money from IPOs, where a single investment bank and a single accountancy firm look at their numbers and put the green checkbox on. And then individual investors can come in and just, do I basically like this company? They don't have to do their own due diligence and start from scratch. And so on a single day, a for-profit company can raise possibly all the money it will ever need to raise. And from then on, they're off to the races, profitable, can go global, and so forth. There's no equivalent of that in the nonprofit side. The Audacious Project, in some ways, is an attempt to be the equivalent of that. So you bring together these donors in one retreat, in one meeting at a time for a couple of days, and say to them, Okay, we've done the work over the last six months. These are amazing projects, amazing projects. Dig into them, pick the one or two that you like, form a subgroup, focus on it, zoom in the project lead, get comfortable with it, but the clock is ticking. By the time we leave, you're going to make a decision whether to support or not, because we know that once you've left, we're back to kick the can down the road. And the amazing thing is, this process is, is working, um, and... So in, in the last retreat we had in February, a year ago, um, the, there were 10 projects, and um, in aggregate, more than a billion dollars was raised for them, committed. And it, and it was raised in the last hour of, of the retreat through a process of infectious generosity. 10 different circles around 10 different projects. Someone says, I'm persuaded, I'm moved. This is important, this is an amazing team. I'm in if others of you will come in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. We're a social species. We actually love doing things together. And big, big donors aren't all assholes. <laughs> 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 they, I mean, they really, they, they want a better world. They do, they do this, they come away, they have the most expensive weekend of their life, and they cry with joy. So there's something right here. There is something going very, very right here. And, and as you know, in this connected age, everything is about a flywheel turning, about a network effect. They are helping us recruit more people to continue to scale this. And I just think this project is something that anyone could do. I mean, honestly, Paul, it's a, you're kind of probably doing versions of this here already. But the, just the idea, I mean, it's the very idea of convening people, change makers, is breaking this awful pattern of, people trying to make one-on-one -on -one things when the hard things can only be done in community. You know, it's, it, it takes collaboration of um, sometimes of actual non-profit efforts, but especially of, of donors for the big things. And uh, another huge benefit of that is that you, you get away from what people resent so much, which is the, a, a single individual rich person on a whim deciding how they're going to change the world. This is not this justifiably raises questions in people's minds, even when those efforts are actually really good and well thought out. Um, by doing it this way, everyone can have a stake in principle in what is the idea, how do we make it better? And it should be everyone's conversation. And then groups of people can afford to do so can fund it. So I, I think the logical implication of that is that we could think of charitable work, philanthropic work, in a different way. We could think of it not as... I, I, I honestly think a lot of people just feel this sort of, I know I should do some of that, or I should give to that, but there's this sort of... There's not a lot of joy in it. It's, sort of, it's done out of ob obligation and so forth. I think the shift to make is to dream about possibility. The possibilities of what change makers could do outside the market. I'm a big believer in the power of the market, by the way. Um, it does so many things right. It spread amazing ideas across the planet. It also, as we know, does many things wrong and creates 
inequality, exploitation, and so forth. Whatever you think about the market, there is a growing number of things in our future that I think will only be done by people working imaginatively, boldly, bravely, tirelessly outside the market. And the, and the way to think about that work, it's not as this tire, endless grind of pushing a boulder up the hill. It's, 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 it's a, of an unexplored possibility space of amazing dreams. We, there are thrilling ways to change the world that tap into the power of technology or knowledge transfer or leveraging government to unlock all those wasted pounds that are happening there. The internet itself or lever to leverage entrepreneurship, to leverage the market. Um, that's what Acumen does, and it's, it's kind of amazing to me to see the leverage that comes out from that. To leverage artificial intelligence, perchance. That there are so many beautiful things that we can dream of doing, not just small scale, but actually at scale, at world-changing scale. And if we could shift that conversation so that it was those stories that are on the front page, I mean, how exciting would that be? That, that's what the future wants, actually. Like it, it, it wants a future where he, we see each other as having these superpowers of being able to dream about a better world and talk to each other and persuade each other that this dream actually is doable and then work together and, and do it and then celebrate it, um, celebrate it widely. That's the world I, I, I dream of and I, I feel like I'm among fellow travelers here. So I do, for everyone here who's, who, who is working for something bigger than you are. I, I really, I, I salute you. I think it's incredible. I think it's extraordinary. And um, good luck with it. I hope at some point the power of infectious generosity in this weird, scary, dangerous, but wonderful world that we're in will come to your aid. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, Stuart Taylor from uh, Just Dig It. Uh, we restore green, uh, desertified land in poor parts of Africa, uh, helping farmers and restore ecosystems and so on. Um, thanks very much. I was very inspired by your talk about how to how to think about um, fundraising from high net worth individuals, uh, philanthropists, and so on. Do you have any um, thoughts? Maybe it's in the book, which I'm looking forward to reading. But do you have any thoughts about approaching corporations where also so much money resides that could be put to better use? Thank you. So I don't specifically address that in the book. What I do address is that I think corporations have a growing incentive and need to have a generosity strategy. Um, most value now created in co corporations is created through human minds. To create that value, you need to recruit the best human minds. The best human minds don't want to work for evil companies, honestly. And, um, and so y you had better have a great story to tell about how you are doing good to the planet, to the world in some way. So the main way that that should happen is through the actual main work of the corporation. You know, if you're exploiting the planet, don't do that. Figure out a way of changing that business model to, you know, to be cyclic in some way. Um, but uh, uh, many others supplement that with, you know, corporate generosity programs of some of some kind. And I, I think, I think. Tapping into that is good. I, I, would, I, I think just the tools, the same tools of being audacious may well work. Of like A lot of co corporations, especially big ones, they, they want to be associated with something exciting. They want a great story that they can tell their employees and, and say, look at what we did. So figure out what is, the, what is the headline. What is the headline that would be so exciting for that company to read? And, uh, and go in with that. Tap into, don't, don't focus on you ought to do this in, in any sort of sense or implication. It's like this would be so exciting. Or here is a really amazing way to solve this problem that you are positioned to make possible, I guess. I think that's what I'd say. Microphone ahead. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hello. I'm Dan, co-founder of Thrival, so we are on the profit side of a proactive mental health and well-being business. And I'd like to ask you more about that kind of emotional side. So what we do is, you know, um, quite expensive and quite a, a shift in f away from the kind of tokenistic um, well-being, which has perhaps been proven not to be particularly, I call it well-being washing, um, and so trying to win hearts and minds has been really interesting on our startup journey, here with my business partner, Anwen. Um, so I just want to ask about selling on fear or selling on... Because <laughs> we naturally want to say this is a great thing for your organisation to do. You're commercially going to be better, your people are going to be better. Um, but it doesn't seem to... And we're at the start of this movement. But um, so we've kind of recognised we need to dial up the fear a bit more as well, right? What, what's your perspective on that? Thank you. I mean, I think it's wise to be smart. You know, we've got to do, we've got to understand human psychology. So long as you're not telling untruths, um, I think there is a lot to fear from mental health issues in an org. And so, um, you, you know use it, like to, to try, try different experiments and try what works. But um, in, in a lot of areas where people have just relied on fear, in the end it's, it's not proved to be the long-term thing. For example, in climate, um, I think there's, a, on, on the data I've seen, the fear story isn't the best way to communicate, to engage people on climate. It was, it was a good way of kicking it off. You know, an Inconvenient Truth was promoted as the scariest movie you'll ever see. That's fine. You get people's attention. But now the winning message actually is... It's not even hope, I don't think. That's, that's too Pollyanna. It's love. Do you love your kids? Do you love the beauty of this planet? What are you doing to protect them? What are you doing to protect it? And so uh, use it, but with, with, with caution. Um, and, and be open to, if you can get to the dream or the, the positive emotions, I, I think long term that may be even better in the end. Yeah. Hi, Chris. 
Um, firstly, I wanted to say thank you. You have a packed out room. It's 100% rain outside. It's first thing in the morning, midweek. Really well done and thank you. It shows how infectious your message is. Um, I'm Dr. Mandeep Rai, the author of The Values Compass, and I help people align to their core values. So with that said, I feel as though some of your core values might be creativity and courage. What's been the most audacious thing you've had to do as a project, aside from TED and the Acumen Fund and all the, you know, the well-known things we've seen you do? Like, for example, the boat trip you mentioned. I don't know. What has been the most audacious step you've had to take to convince? I mean, definitely the biggest risks on TED were just giving, giving stuff away. And that, that, was, that was where the biggest benefits come back. Um, TED used to be, when I took over TED, it was a once a year conference in California. And it was definitely um, scary to decide to give away the best content. We thought we might lose the conference, but it was actually what, mm. what, what made it. And uh, if I'd been a business, I'm not sure I'd have had the courage to do it. It was the combination of thinking it probably made sense, but and being a non-profit, where we sort of felt, well, we've got an obligation to do it anyway, so we're going to have to try. Um, that was the biggest. There was another big one just when, when we moved to Vancouver, where it was um, a conference center that was, it was the perfect city, perfect hotels, perfect everything. There was just no theater, but there was a huge big box. And so it was just a chance to dream with a designer. What would the perfect talk theater look like where, for maximum impact? And uh, working with David Rockwell, we you know, designed this sort of surround thing that was beautiful, but we didn't know that it could actually be constructed in the time that we had for setup. So there was, there was, there was a little craziness there, but I, I, taking risks is, is, is really fun when they work. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the big, I think, I genuinely think the biggest um, uh, or most audacious thing people can do is have a brainstorm and ask the question, what is the most radical thing that we could give away? Uh, and often it's, it's knowledge, actually. You know, we think of competitive advantage as hold on to the secret knowledge so that no one else can do what we do. That's quite possibly the wrong thing in this connected age because by opening it up, you inspire other people to want to work with you and to use that knowledge to do good things and you make it easier to recruit people. There's just a lot else that can happen from giving away the best knowledge that you have about something. Hey. Hello, I'm Josie. I'm on the front row here. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> so the mic is over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I'm right here. Um, so you've written a book called Infectious Generosity. I was interested to know whether that's had any unexpected side effects or blowback, where people now are asking you for lots of things. Um, and along <laughs> along those lines, um, what's maybe been one of like the most unexpected outcomes of writing this book? That's been yeah, it's been a process, I suppose. I mean, it's it's definitely challenge me to get out of my sort of awkward English introvert self and, um, and look at people who I otherwise wouldn't and um, some, sometimes make connections and have conversations. Even, you know, someone on the street, um, like I, I, I'm so uncomfortable doing that. But when I do, and even whether or not I, you know, give someone money or whatever, just the experience of doing that, I go away thinking, huh, I prefer that version of me. Um, and so I, th I, think, I think a lot of generosity, you know, it starts with um, just a mental mindset, a willingness to pay attention to someone else. And it's, it is a gift. It's uncomfortable. We, we have so much on our plates. Just to, to, to pay attention to something outside our daily routine r really is, is quite hard. But the, the magic is that um, that's payback. And, and, and the more you do it, 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 it you know, it's, it's, it's like a muscle. It gets a little bit easier, and you remember that the payback actually feels good. Um, there's all this um, you know, kind of absurd dispute, I would say, in philosophy over is generosity generosity if it's not done just solely from pure moral motive? Um, it's never been done purely from moral motive. 
um, scratching your conscience feels good in its own way. There's always, you know, give and your reward shall be in heaven. I was brought up with that. It's transactional, as it turns out. <laughs> um, so, so we should be celebrating additional motives to be generous, not dissing on people for it. I, possibly the, the most important chapter in the book is called Imperfect Generosity. I'm sick of the cynicism in the world where every time someone does something, people say, oh, yeah, but were they just doing it for the views? Or they could have given more? Or that's not really tackling the underlying problem, is it? We, do we, you know, we're in an existential battle here between the spreading of good, positive things, good stories about each other, or bad. And um, we, we, we need every tool in our armory. And, and so to say to someone, it's actually great that if you go through that uncomfortable moment and it leads to something, it leads to lots of people, say, knowing about what you're doing, and it turns out that some of them may help then help you, and you might have guessed that that would happen, and you might have guessed that your reputation will rise, this is all great. This is all great and to be celebrated. So that, that flip from looking for reasons to be cynical, flip that and instead look for reasons to fight, fight, look for good intention. If you can find a piece of good intention in there, celebrate it. Um, so notice how I backed away from your awkwardly <laughs> personal question, but that's <laughs> I need some work still, but thank you. <laughs> Morning, Chris. Um, this is a question about impact. Not all ideas that spread have a similar impact. I recently gave my first TED Talk at TED Countdown here in London. It was a nerve-wracking experience, but it was on a topic I love, which is sustainable aviation. And I realized that the people in the room were absolutely brilliant. By the end of the talk, I couldn't care less if I, my talk gets views or not, but these people in the room were amazing. So when you created TED, you had the people in the room, and then you had the online platform. What has created a bigger impact, and would you do anything differently if you were to do it again? I mean, just based on the numbers, it's highly likely that the online platform has led to greater impact. But it would probably never have happened without the people in the room. I mean, part of the reason why people watch TED Talks is because of this feeling that you've got an inside view of, of information that, that was shared with the sort of elite audience or whatever. Uh, that was certainly how the original TED Talks took off. It was like, you know, no one has seen what happened inside that venue until now. Um, <laughs> um, um, but yeah, no, the ripple, what's amazing about ripple effects is that you never actually know what the final outcome is going to be. Like m many of the stories, you will never know. And you just have to take, you just have to count on the fact that the, the spreading of, for example, good knowledge, good ideas, or whatever, is going to have an impact down the line. And I, I it, get really moved when I actually hear stories from people who say, you know what, you don't know this, but, but I actually, my university was crap, and, uh, but I learned a lot from uh, watching talks, and thank you. And what, you know, it, it doesn't happen every day, but when it does, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, so impact will be different for, for everyone. But in, in the world of, if you can find some path to infectiousness, trust, trust the universe that that is going to lead to good things. It usually does. Chris, uh, Nick Marks Hi. here. Yes. Over here. OK, there you go. Hello. Got you. Um, Hello, Nick. Hi. Uh, um, Great to see you. Thank you. Um, thank scale. You. Thank, you for, thank you for spreading happiness. That's the okay, case. So <laughs> well, as you know, I'm quite aligned with this. You know, mm. I did a TED Talk 12 years ago, and my opening line was, Martin Luther King didn't have a nightmare, he had a dream. And the environmental movement doesn't think enough about what his positive vision is. Um, new Happy Planet notes coming out at the end of next month, by the way. Um, but it's about a scale. A scale. Mm. System change. We often talk about micro and macro, and I think we miss the middle bit, the meso, the... The, the organizations, the teams, the local communities. And, and positive messages, the data is very clear in psychology that weak ties, negative emotions, and anger can move much more quickly. Strong ties, positive emotions can change much more, which a bit addresses your thing over there. 
So a big study of Weibo that can look at all these texts and things. So I'm wondering whether you talk about scale of infectious generosity, because my feeling is you've got it dead right if you're getting donors or people in the same room, that they're in groups of 10, 12, that those go together, because I, I don't think we can do it at a macro level. And at, at an individual level, it also doesn't work. And I, for me, it's the feeling is it's right there in the middle that where infectious generosity be most strong. <laughs> I didn't understand when, I just want to make sure I understood. You said that with weak ties, negativity travels faster. You're saying that negative news will travel fast through a network of people who don't know each other that well. But if they are closer to each other, then it's, it's positive news that will, that will be yes. celebrated and embraced. So if you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook. You're on weak ties. Anger, anger yeah. will travel much faster than happiness. Whereas if it's strong ties, it's family groups. You don't want to deal with the anger, you'll deal with the happiness yeah. and the positivity. Strong evidence on that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good insight. Um, I mean, look, Im impact is the name of the game. And one thing that, that I think I believe when you look at the future of, of the change maker sector, right now there's an incredible asymmetry between non-profit sector and the for-profit sector. In the for-profit sector, most impact comes from the at-scale companies. Like if you look at the technology you own and the things you do and whatever, probably almost all of those products are made by 20 different tech companies who collectively count for 90% of the sort of tech action that is actually rippled out into the world. Um, and that's where the economic value is and so forth. Th th there's reasons for that in that scale carries its own power. With scale, you can benefit from all the platform effects of a connected world. Um, it's easier with branding. It's easier with, you know, we all know that once, once you're doing a thing a certain way, habit keeps you in that way. The nonprofit sector is massively fractured, and there's lots and lots of people doing smaller things, and they're all good, but it's, it's to some extent, we're all creating friction for each other. And so I would argue that Long term, the future we should dream of is of more things being dreamed of at scale and more ways to, you know, if you can think of a way to collaborate with other orgs, for example, and come up with a big plan that you can all do together, that, that may be a powerful winning play that can build. You know, the, the goal is to get the flywheel turning where people know about your work and they, they want to come to it and participate in it. And it's, it's, it's really hard to get there because of the way that we're, we're structured. But I, I would like to think that the future, like for me, my, my dream, which probably won't ever happen, but is that like the logic of the Audacious Project is that each year, the best and biggest and boldest 10 projects that are at massive scale, you know, here, here is a plan to reform agriculture. And it involves a bunch of different organizations and it's, it's, a, it's a sort of spectacular scale, that if you could get the whole world excited, yes, this is so exciting, and get people behind it, the very fact that it was at scale would be what would allow it to gather momentum and actually have a chance of working. So I, I think we should, dream, we should dream more of scale. Scale really, really matters. And when you can get there, everything gets a bit easier and it gets more consequential. Hi, I'm Anna from the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty and i kind of building on that question. Um, you know, there are loads of great, great organizations out there that are doing incredible work. Um, you know, obviously we're in the environmental space but across poverty and all sorts of social issues. And the reality is they're never going to get the opportunity to get those big investments, even if they are dreaming big. Um, so I guess I'd love to just hear some ideas, um, some advice that you might give some of those organizations that are, you know, working hard, doing great work, but may not find that, that nexus between either getting in front of those donors or getting those big transformational gifts that are really going to allow them to scale. I mean, it is a challenging journey. Um, I come back to those two words of, of um, creativity and courage. 
it's like tr tr can can you figure out a new way to frame your message? Can you picture what's the craziest video message you could picture mailing to potential donors that would that would land? Um, I mean, it's when something takes off, it really takes off. I, Maria Eitel, who used to work at Nike, was involved in this thing. She created this video called The Girl Effect. And this one little two-minute video did more than any TED Talk we ever put out of persuading people around the world that educating girls was an absolutely transformative thing to do for the, for the future. It's just, it was like there was a logic to it, research went into it, but it, in the end of the day, it was a, a two-minute animation. And um, so, so stuff like that can happen. I mean, you've got a really powerful message to share. Um, how else might you share it? And by the way, there are, there are a growing up, AI can play a role here in helping you visualize. I mean, if any of you have asked AIs, for example, to dream up a new look for your home, you'll see how amazing that is. Or how about a new look for your nonprofit or your, your mission? There's, we, have, um, we built an AI, actually, um, at infectiousgenerosity.org. It's called TIG, uh, the Infectious Generosity Guru. And what you do is you sign up for that, and, and it asks you what your skills are and what you're interested in. Then it helps you brainstorm. And it, it's, it's actually, I mean, it won't come up with the right idea, but it will poke you and, and give you suggestions that uh, are, are quite exciting. I mean, a couple of people have said this has been completely transformative for us already. Um, so that, that would be one thing to try, is to see if you can tap into... AI. So that, that's infectiousgenerosity.org. It's free. And then there's three people here after that. Oh, it's me. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Obina. I'm a bit new to the space, not going to lie. Um, but this has been a very impactful talk, so thank you very much. I'm going to be a bit audacious right now and have a two-parter, but allow me people. Um, <laughs> firstly, um, I work with a lot of youth um, in getting them to express themselves using spoken word. And my question to you, sort of um, going to a previous topic where there's a lot of cynicism in the world, how do you go about gaining trust, especially with communities who traditionally haven't necessarily been given the best of hands um, in society, and then people coming over and saying, hey, I'm going to help you, and I'm like, I don't really know who you are. Um, how do you go about gaining trust for those sorts of communities? Um, and uh, the second question, I forgot, so never mind, it's just a one part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Love it. I mean, look, tr trust, to establish trust in the first place does take an element of, of courage. I mean, the way that people seem to be wired is that we, we respond to trust. We also respond to mistrust. Um, uh, we're, just, we're just so um, social, you know, like we take all these cues off each other. So at some point, someone needs to go in and do the equivalent of laying down weapons and take a, be vulnerable, take a risk. It could possibly be used against you, but, um, but I think that's how trust gets, gets built. So it's like being willing to say something to them that they wouldn't expect, where you, you, almost, you come over as, just, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a flawed human being, like all of us are, um, but, but eager to learn and curious about them. I, I don't know if I've got anything wiser to say than that. It, I will say this, that I've, I've become convinced that the next generation coming through are even more sick of the meanness of the world than we are, and even more convinced that you actually can use the tools of connectedness to change that narrative. I mean, you, you know, we, we, many, many of you will know of Jimmy Donaldson, Mr. Beast, who's, who's the top influencer pretty much on YouTube. He's not, a, he's not spouting doom and gloom, and you know, he's, he's, he's spouting amazingness and often kindness. His videos are incredible, and they're, they're big. He, he's figured out how to make videos go viral spectacularly. And some people, at least in my generation, find him really annoying because it's like, you know, you're not addressing the underlying problem or something. He, he's inspiring millions and millions of youth to think that kindness can be cool. And, uh, and I've spoken to others who've been inspired by him who've who've um, said the same thing, that we're, we're going to win this battle, actually, online, that the, that the assholes and the nastiness, that that doesn't last. People, people want something that will last, and to build something that will last, you need to go to the good side. So I, that there may be more fertile soil there than, than 
you suspect, but obviously every situation is different. Some people who've had a horrifying life and been through a lot, why would they trust anyone? So I, I don't have any easy answers, and I admire what you're doing, and I think it's, it's really important, and it's really cool. Can we have time for one last question here? Hello, hi. Um, so I, I run an organization called the News Literacy Lab, and we help young people navigate the news. We actually look at the negativity bias as a contributor to a misinformed worldview. Um, and I just wonder how much you think education plays in the incubation of generosity. So if you can speak about it directly with young people from an early age, especially when the information or the default information settings don't necessarily cater for that from an early age. Yeah, I, I, there's so much that you wish we could change about education. So much education still operates as if Google was, had never been invented. <laughs> like, like, knowledge is not a problem in the modern, you can, you could, everything is out there available for free. Education does not need to be about cramming people's heads with knowledge at all. It needs to be about how to build knowledge, how to navigate the, the, the current world, how to navigate yourself, your own freaking weird instincts, you know, that you're an evolved animal with this instinctive self that is sometimes amazing but can take you down really difficult paths. For me, the single biggest question that, should, that education should be about is how do you empower your reflective self to control and direct your instinctive self? If we could make that at the heart of education, everything else shifts. From there, you can get to things like critical thinking and how to learn that, how to use the coming amazingness of AI and the tools of the internet to change. Um, I think what you're doing is, sounds like it's really, really, really important because you're showing people that to ask questions about the world as it is received. You know, you are not necessarily being given the truth or an accurate or fair picture of the world. We all have to work to fix that. So, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. Can we give Chris a round of applause, please?